There we go. Now we got the good camera and the good microphone. One minute while we get everybody admitted to the call. Do do do. Lie Zoom. There was a second and a third person in, and now they're gone. All right. Well, let's do with what we can. Give a couple more minutes for people to join up. Get online. Oh, just cracking like a glow stick. I think some people are having trouble getting online. Uh, I think Zoom has an update, so it's causing people to not connect to their um, Zoom, connect the audio. Um, so just bear with us while we get everything going. Sometimes tech stuff causes us issues. Three after, give it one more minute or so. Did it do? Did it do? <laughs> All right. While everybody's getting logged in and they're dealing with technical issues, let's get started. I don't want to waste all anybody's time that are on. Uh, today is fight. We are going to be talking about uh, the difference in the world that we're seeing today versus years past. Uh, and before we jump into that, uh, I hope you guys are all in a safe location, a uh, place that you can connect um, to the call without putting yourselves or others in danger. some red tape. Um, welcome to all the new members. I've seen a few more heads pop up, which is great. Uh, if you have any questions, concerns, feel free to reach out uh, to me and my team uh, via the internal chat or make a post and any one of the members can assist you uh, or answer those questions as a group. Uh, I highly recommend getting engaged, staying engaged. Um, I was actually recently thinking about it uh, Matt and myself and Tish were meeting and, and I, I've been dropping the ball and I've been talking about writing my book for way too long. So I sat down and I set a schedule for myself. I will be spending three hours a day, uh, trying to write as much as I can in that time and getting distracted and having ADHD and, you know, staying away from my phone and all that stuff to try and get it done. Last night I put two and a half hours in of actual consistent writing. So, uh, I got quite a lot done. Uh, so that book's going to be coming out as soon as I get that done and get it proofread and edited. Um, so look forward to that. Uh, that's going to be a real tactical resource document that really focuses on setting a foundation of not only defining what we believe here at Heroes, but also uh, giving some tactical tool sets so that you can actually step into sovereignty the fastest that you can. And so the reason I bring that up is today's call was on my mind when I was writing, and, and it's one of those things where I think as a decadent and luxurious society, we we kind of overlook preparedness as almost paranoia. We've conflated the two. And I think it puts people at a, at a huge disadvantage um, in life. And there was a quote that I was, that's been just nagging at my, my mind. And it is a free man has the ability to protect their freedom. Whereas a serf and a slave do not. 
And I think a lot of times when you hear a quote like that, people think immediate violence, right? I have the ability to do jujitsu or shoot a gun or whatever, but protecting your freedom is a lot more than just that. And we're going to talk about that a lot today. Um, because when we talk about fight, we talk about survival. Um, it's not just the violent stuff. It's the micro transactions that you do leading up to a situation or, or the preparedness that you do leading up to a situation so that when those things occur, you you're able to handle it no matter what they are. There's no need to have, you know, uh, every exit covered, uh, for the situation. Uh, when you have the skills to kind of roll with the punches, you're able to just kind of pull on that. Uh, And this is very similar in martial arts. If we were to talk about violence, um, one of the number one issues that people have when learning new martial arts is they want to have a plan and then they get punched in the mouth and the plan goes out the window. And so when you're in martial arts, the idea is you progressively learn new things so that you have a bigger tool set. And then when a, a situation occurs or violence occurs, or you have an altercation, You don't think, okay, step one, I'm going to punch him in the mouth. And step two, I'm going to kick out his legs. And step three, I'm going to do this and do that. Because what it does is it slows down your timing. And then you end up getting punched in the mouth because the plan goes right out the window. So instead, they talk about the necessity of having so many tools in your toolbox that whatever you're presented with in an altercation, you have the tools to counter or address. And so that's kind of what I want to talk today about in in the fight spectrum. You know, do you have the ability to protect your freedom. Are you secure in your skill sets? Are you secure in your mindset? Are you secure in should work? Do you play worst case scenario enough? And what I mean by that is not to scare people, not to like think about the worst case scenarios, but the reality is if you're not playing worst case scenario, at least some of the time, then when worst case scenario hits, you're going to be completely unprepared. And so if you look at the state of the world today, Um, and I just realized that I was going to do some red tape stuff and I just completely skipped it because I just want to talk about this because I really don't care about the red tape stuff. But, uh, and if anybody knows me, they know that's just how I work. I'd rather get into the deep stuff than deal with the admin stuff. Um, so, you know, jumping into this, let's talk about the apocalypse, right? Uh, this is something that I think is on the, uh, the lips and minds of a lot of conservatives, um, seeing kind of the degradation of morality. Uh, the rise of subjectivism. We're seeing a, 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 a large rise and a sharp increase in support for socialism and, and communism. Uh, and part of that is propaganda, right? Part of that is Republicans pushing that propaganda or conservatives pushing that propaganda in the hopes that people will be more conservatively leaning from fear that that may occur. Um, and that's something you should always be aware of. What is propaganda? Everybody is subject to propaganda. And it doesn't matter if it's at a mainstream media level, or if it's at your best friend's level where they're just like, Hey, let me challenge your thinking. That is effectively propaganda and nobody's immune to it. It's just whether or not it's slow to it, or do you have a process of thinking critically through it? But ultimately we're all, we're all victims of propaganda. It's just the way our brain works. We seek that validation piece from our tribe, from our people, the people we trust to let us know kind of how we make our way through the world. And the measure of a, of sovereignty for both men and women is our ability to take that information in and challenge it based on our baseline systems. And I've talked about this many times in the past, especially when it comes to uh, political and socioeconomic conversations. Like most people have lost their baseline. We don't, we don't have a baseline and that's the sharp increase and in rise of subjectivism. There is no baseline. There is no truth. There is no moral right and wrong. There is no way there's a million different ways and it's just however you feel that day and 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 it creates so much confusion and it irre- irrevocably damages people's ability to make decisions securely and confidently. And so when we talk about the apocalypse, um, I like using it because it's shock and awe. People are like, oh, no, apocalypse. And everybody thinks zombies, nuclear war, um, you know, invasion. These are big things that are possible. I mean, maybe not zombies, but in general, right? Like they are potentially possible. I I was joking on my social media the other day. Growing up in the 90s, I feel like we're prepared for right now because you had Jurassic Park talking about genetic reincarnation. You had Terminator talking about AI warfare and Skynet. And you had Red Dawn talking about the invasion of the, the Russians and the Koreans and the Chinese. Well, right now, 
we're trying to genetically reincarnate a mammoth. So hello, Jurassic Park. Welcome to just because you can do it doesn't mean you should. Uh, we have AI going rampant with no regulatory systems and literally becoming sentient. Hello, Skynet. Looking forward to the war on machines. And we have a, a very real possibility of World War III taking place as Russia and China are partnering against us with their allies and creating a whole new commerce system for trade. Now, the reason that this is important, and I think a lot of people under, misunderstand why this is important, one, the US dollar no longer has the same value on the world stage that it once did. It used to be protected, um, it, and we lose our Federal Reserve status if we get we don't have trade currency. And two, one of the name, main ways that we avoid physical violent conflict on the world stage with people who are doing things that we don't like is financial sanctions. Sanctions basically state that if you do not do what we say, we will rob you of the ability to trade. We will rob your country of the ability to have money. We will rob you of these things because you're not allowed to do that. And that's how we maintain control. Basically saying, we'll take your allowance away, right? Basically saying, we'll reduce your money to zero. And that's what Russia was fighting against in the early parts of Ukraine is we were sanctioning the hell out of them. Anything that was American-based, McDonald's, Starbucks, like anything there that had American constructs and then any of their trade agreements lockheed martin any of their aeronautical um contracts any of their uh military contracts we were sanctioning them saying no you can't do that anymore because we took away your dollar and their people were suffering and in his good leadership whether you like him or not he, it's good leadership putin went into china and said okay well we'll make our fucking own fuck those guys and that's what's happening right now the bcri is now i think up to 12 nations have agreed to start trading in BCRI, which is a whole new currency that is not subject to American sanctions. And because it's not subject to American sanctions, we putting trying to impose our will on the world is now greatly reduced and we're at a very big disadvantage. So if this continues, the way we've avoided physical war and conflict is now being severely neutered. That's a big problem uh, because I think Americans between the 80s and now uh see war as us deciding to go and get something. Now we're going to be at a disadvantage of we're going to be seeing war as us saying no, and we have to make a decision. Do we stand the moral righteous way like we did in World War I, or do we stay out of it because we no longer have any any dog in the fight? We don't have our money on the on the line, and we don't have any reason to go and push that moral construct because we don't want our American soldiers dying. And a lot of Americans would agree. Right. A lot of Americans, especially conservative Americans, are like, fuck Ukraine. I don't really care. I don't live there. I don't. That's a Russian problem. Right. Like it'd be basically like California wanting to secede and Texas going to grab California. And we're upset because California wants to be free. Like it, it's really an internal problem, but we're making it a world stage problem. And this is a very, very difficult time to kind of navigate the world as we see the rise of subjectivism really take hold in the in the thought process and ideology politically. And we're seeing a lot of um we're seeing a lot of very real and tangible effects of whether you're a conspiracy theorist or not, it's hard to deny our food food sources becoming under attack. In two in 2022, we lost 500,000 500,000 individual units of food resources in a single year. This year alone, we've already hit like 115,000 units reduction. Farms burning down, large manufacturers and producers of food burning down or blowing up. Like cattle farms exploding out of nowhere because that's viable, right? And and so when you when you think about the apocalypse, I would challenge everybody to think a little bit more subdued. It's not the big bang glint and glam of Hollywood that they would want you to have where there's missiles going in and everybody's yelling DEFCON 5 shit and like all this stuff. It's not going to be like that. We're going to see a collapse of economics. We're going to see a collapse of a standard system of law and order. Uh, we're going to see, we may see invasion, but it won't be till after those things are collapsed. Um, the very real possibility of cyber attacks where they take down our utilities to where we have no power, no no grid, no communications, EMPs past that, which is 
electromagnetic pulses, those shut down everything within however many miles that that yield is configured for. And the thing that people don't seem to realize is like, if an EMP goes off, your cars are fried. All cars have computers, they have batteries, they have a power system, they have chipsets. Once an EMP goes off, all of those gone. It won't start. It won't move. It'll be a giant fucking road ornament. Like they will not work. It doesn't matter if it's gas, electric, or whatever. Obviously, electric is going to be the first, the the worst, right? But that's the reality of what apocalypse we're looking towards now is economic collapse. We're looking towards social collapse. We're looking towards possible invasion, but that's a lot further down the road than I think a lot of people realize or believe, right? The violent means that people believe is happening in this country is actually not happening in this country. They, those things are happening to distract you from economic collapse. Those things are happening to distract you from food scarcities. They hope you don't go look into your banking. They hope you don't go look into the stock market. They hope you don't go look into the insider trading that's happening in Congress and the House of Representatives. They hope you don't go look into government spending. They hope you don't go look into why farms are burning down. They hope you don't go look into Palestine, Ohio, to find out why they're not looking at that ecological disaster. Two trains with chemicals crash in Palestine, Ohio. East Palestine, Ohio. Two. The One or two is an accident. Three or four, we can maybe say a coincidence. And I mean all of this, food, like shortages, economic. Once you get past a few incidents, it's now sabotage. In a short amount of time, it's sabotage. So it's a very real possibility that we may be coming up on hard times as a country, as a nation. And, and if we don't unite, and we still argue about who's got a penis and who doesn't and who you know, is allowed to call themselves a woman or not and who's a birthing person and all this language garbage that we're talking about. If that's what you're focusing on right now, if that's what you care about right now, you are ill-prepared for the coming wave of detriment that you're going to experience. So let's let's talk about like what happens, right? What are the first, what is the first thing you're going to feel when, when an apocalypse, a subtle apocalypse happens, whether it's economic collapse, whether it's EMPs and electricity drops, whether it's grid removals, whether it's food shortages. And we got a little bit of a micro dose of that already. Right. We saw that with COVID when nobody knew what was going on. Toilet paper was gone. Right. You know what that shows me? When toilet paper is gone, that's a bunch of unprepared people panic buying things. They have no logic or rhyme or reason to things. They're just panic buying shit. Cleaning supplies, panic buying shit. You'd rather have bleach than bread. That's a problem that you should probably remedy because those. They don't correlate. If you're in a if you're in an in game scenario like that, um, bread is going to be much more viable than toilet paper, and fucking bleach. It's just the reality of it. So within the first week uh, of a subtle apocalypse like that, uh, those panic buyings are going to happen. Random shit's going to be off the shelf, right? All of the um, all of the good food will be gone. The high protein, high quality food will be gone. Most of your canned foods, um, long term, long sitting foods will be gone. Last will go will be the junk foods, the candies, the the chips, the the bullshit like that. Um. So within that first few days, you'll see a lot of those resources just become extremely scarce. Um. The first week, many people will try and wait it out. They'll go about their business. Right. If if it's a, a full grid shutdown, meltdown where there's no power, no nothing, most people just kind of hide in their house. They won't go anywhere. Um, but then after that week, if it doesn't clear up, but there's no planned restoration or no ETA on restoration. And instead, things are either getting worse or staying the same after that week. Real panic sets in. People become very frantic. People become very desperate. That's when the looting and the riots begin. After that first week, you better have spent that first week getting the fuck out of Dodge. Any heavily populated areas, any um, you know, major metropolitan city states, you need to be out. Because what's going to happen after that first week is they're going to blame the government. And in that blaming of the government, they're going to start rioting and burning down government buildings. They're going to start sacking whole cities, 
and they're going to be going to town. Now, the irony of this is they're wasting precious time and resources because they're throwing a tantrum like a five-year-old because they've never thought of the possibility that the government could not support them, could not protect them. It, it, it's, it's the nature of insulation. Once the veil of false security is pulled away, they look for somebody to blame. We see this with children and parents, right? The children start to blame the parents because finally they're part of the real world and they feel unprepared, despite every parent's tr uh, attempt to make them prepared. So within that first week, you will see panic buying. At the end of that first week, the riots and looting will start. Um, the more metropolitan areas, violence will start faster. When you have a larger congregation and a larger concentration of humans in panic, mob mentality sets in much faster. That mob mentality, they will break into tribes, they will break into gangs, they will start to segment themselves. And where we previously saw the United States, depending on what side of the political fence you are, as a united front, as one people, one nation, one country, we will now start to see us versus them in a much more microchasm structure. Neighborhoods against neighborhoods, you will see potentially even neighbor against neighbor very quickly in that. Um, following that first week to getting into the second week, uh, that's when looting of homes starts. I should have clarified that. First week, it'll be panic buying, but then it'll be looting because by the end of the first week, all digital currency, all money will have no value. And so nobody's going to trade money for food. So then they're going to loot the corporations. They're going to loot the big places, the low hanging fruit, which is like gas stations and, and grocery stores, right? Once those are picked clean, the next level up is looting homes, looking for people that might've been prepared and going house to house to try and get whatever resources they need. And they may come to your house in force. They may come to your house starting pleasant and then trick you. There's a lot of things. Distrust becomes a, a kind of the currency of the realm at that point. Like who you trust better be locked the fuck down. Like I talked about it the other day um, with my dad and with my buddy. Like I got a CB radio. Like we have a plan that should shit go down. If it happens here first, I go there. If it happens there first, they come here. And we know exactly what channel we're on for the CB radio. And we have a progression. If this has too much chatter, we move to this channel, then this channel. If I'm not on any of those channels, either assume something bad happened or continue to cycle through it until you get me. But we know we have that plan. Like that's how you plan for that stuff. Because within that week, if that if if it's just a market crash, right? Just the currency falls apart, what I just said applies. But if it's a full grid shutdown, the additional hurdle is you no longer get to communicate. If it's an EMP, you're fucked. You better have a rendezvous point because you're not going to be able to call anybody. You better know how to do Indian smoke signals or I should say indigenous people smoke signals. Like you you have to be able to do these things and have these skill sets within that first three weeks and you better be able to make those decisions quickly because one of the number one things that I have seen kill more people than anything is hesitance. A hesitation. When do I leave my house? When do I go by? When do I go do this? When do I go do this? You better have a system of auditing to know what that looks like because in a in a world like that, very different from the world we've lived in over the past you know two decades, uh, probably last century, um, it, your your closest confidant may become your your first enemy, right? There's an old saying: betrayal is never from a stranger. That's just the reality of it, right? And so when you start looking at fight or flight responses, you better start looking at your circle as who's equipped to handle the panic, who's equipped to handle the frustration, who's equipped to handle diversity, who's equipped to handle um, scarcity the most proper way because the people that panic the easiest are the ones that are going to be the first to be slithering in and snaking your shit and ratting you out, right? They're going to be the ones to kiss the boots of the strongest person. That's the, that's the reality of apocalypse, right? And so once you get to week three, it's anybody's game. If nothing's back online within three weeks, it's pretty much a free-for-all. Riots already happened. Low-hanging fruit looting's already happened. House-to-house -house looting has already started. Uh, you know, tribal mentalities where people are segmenting has already started to begun. 
uh, a complete degradation of society as we know it has already begun. And it's a, it's a quick decline from there. Now, once you get into week three and you're in a free-for-all, this is where um, a lot of people start to realize that nobody's coming to save them. This is usually the point where people start to realize that things are not getting restocked. So then the low hanging fruit has already been picked. So they go to the top of the tree. Now the top of the tree is like manufacturing plants, right? Processing centers. So now people are getting together as gangs to go and take on whole warehouses to steal. Now these are fully secured buildings, right? These are, these are very locked down buildings. They got giant metal gates. They got giant metal doors. They, they usually have some kind of a scan barcode system. Well, with no electricity, most of those locks are going to shut down. And so within that three-week period, once people start going after warehouses and processing centers, that's when people start to get very militant, very, very violent. Because now you're talking about having to blow a hole in the side of a building. You're talking about breaching, breaching buildings, moving through areas. Now, corporations that want to preserve their safety of, of their dollar in the hopes that the country will bounce back because that's what most corporations are going to try and do is they're going to try and weather. So they're going to try and maintain those resources and money as long as they can. They may trade food and resources for armed security. And you're going to start hearing things about how so-and-so tried to take that Amazon processing center and they got fucking shot. That's going to happen. Right. And once that starts to happen, once that's when, you know, or that's where most people finally realize that it's it's the end game. Now, how long we bounce back or how long it takes us to bounce back from something of that magnitude uh, really depends on the, on the society. How prepared are they, right? Like the rednecks are probably going to bounce back pretty fucking quick because they've been, their entire life is built on self-preservation. But the LA socialites, probably not going to bounce back very quick. They have no marketable skills in an apocalyptic system, right? Uh, Twitter fingers are not really useful um, when it comes down to hunting and gathering. And it, and it sure as shit isn't when you're trying to loot and riot against things. So that means that once that system comes into play, gang warfare it, uh, is what you need to know how to do. It's violent. It's an honor system based on the tribe. You don't want to get ostracized, so you need to find how you fit and and do it as best you can, because it becomes a very very quickly becomes a meritocracy, because you are now taking up a resource. That resource is limited food, limited space, limited warmth, limited electricity, limited whatever those resources are. You are taking that information and or taking those resources, and so what ends up happening is it quickly becomes a meritocracy. What are you doing of value that brings the wasting of this or the spending of this, I should say, resource on you valuable to me? That becomes the commodity of the realm. That becomes the currency of the realm is what are you bringing to the table of value? And so if you're not developing the skills right now when they're arbitrary, come when they become necessary, come the time when they become necessary, you will be too little, too late day late dollar short kind of thing. And uh, Marcus Torgerson always quotes this and I absolutely love it. Once the war drums beat, it's too late to sharpen your axe. So the the idea behind that quote is you should be sharpening your axe well before you need that axe. And in this case we're 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 using that as a as a metaphor for skill sets, for value systems, for preparedness, for mentality. So you get about a month before things really just kind of fall apart um, entirely. That's how fast it happens. Now, I would argue that it happens faster in places where sycophantic socialites are the mechanism in the tribal mechanism of the realm, right? If you are surrounded by a bunch of good old boys with guns and hunt and drink beer and stuff like that, then your system is not going to change too much. That system is pretty much standard for meritocracies what value to bring to the table can i trust you those are those are pretty standard for them because they have a very a very traditional view on the world they have a very traditional look on the world so those things will happen don't get me wrong i'm not saying that they're immune to those things but they're going to be much better prepared to handle those things happening than say the middle of san francisco in their you know 750,000 million dollar 
flat where they walk to, you know, some local cuisine eatery for their food and they have nothing in the fridge 95% of the time because they their entire system is based wholly on the social experience of going out and eating and talking about how much you can afford to eat. They're not going to be equipped. So once that happens, those systems are going to fall about uh, fall apart a lot quicker than in, you know, the Appalachian Mountains where the boys have been hunting and, and keeping jerky for the last, you know, 20 years. Their family's been on that land forever. They know it, they go hunting. Um it's a very different world and you have to in your preparation which we're going to get into now because i just wanted to set the tone of like what that looks like um if you are not honest about where you land in those two dichotomies right because i do see those as the two polar opposite dichotomies you have the in insulated socialites who don't do anything for themselves and they're just used to things on demand and then you have the uh, traditional redneck Appalachian hill people who only care about what they can hunt and kill themselves. And, and they know they have a, quite a lot of skills. Like those are polar opposites. And in between that, everyone in society kind of falls in that realm. Right. And then even outside of that, you have outliers, you have, you have outliers outside of those two polars, for instance, on the, on the far side with the rednecks uh, and the, and the hillbillies, you have the doomsday preppers. Now they may have all the skills, they may have all this stuff, but they have so much paranoia. They they're not logically thinking through things. And then on the opposite side, you have the the apocalypse deniers who can watch all of these things happen within that month and still believe that it'll bounce back without them doing anything. And they just want to hunker down and sit in their home, and not do anything, and they just hope for the best. So those are really the polar opposites. But if you want to talk about functional and common, the two polar opposites is the socialite. And the redneck and in between there most people fall somewhere in between um depending on where you live uh how well off you are what your hobbies and likes and dislikes are how much you play worst case scenario right our mindsets all garner this type of experience now as we move away from explaining what those that first month is going to look like now we start talking about like okay well what do you do like, what does that look like? What does that even mean? Like, you can say that, but what what exactly looking at that frame of this is what's going to happen in that one month, how do you make sure that your family eats, stays warm, is safe? Because that's what it's going to come down to. Food, water, shelter, protection. Like, that's that's what it's going to come down to. And you're going to have to change that switch in your mind. You're going to have to flip that switch in your mind from a, a, a good idea to being an absolute necessity. And that's another area I think most people don't understand how hard that switch can be if you don't practice. Like Matt and I talk about it all the time. As a man, as a protector, our job is to make sure that we make the hard decisions for our family. So that means that if it comes to the point where I got to put heads on spikes, I got to be willing to do that. When an attacker comes, I have to deter that attacker. And then I have to make sure that nobody else has that idea again. That's what apocalyptic gang tribal warfare is. Morality is now no longer governed by how luxurious your life is. Morality is now governed by necessity. Right and wrong is now weighted against survival, which is very, very different than when it's blue sky scenarios. And I think a lot of people have been in blue sky scenarios so long that they literally cannot fathom what would happen if the storm comes and they have to, say, kill a neighbor. They have to, say, eat a dog because it's the only food that they know how to get. These are hard things to think about when you're thinking about survival and apocalypse, but they're real things that you need to think about. Now, we as men should be protecting our family from those things. We as men should be, as a provider and a protector, setting up the balance so that they know they will make those calls so that the women and children don't have to. And they will protect them by making sure that it happens somewhere else. And it disconnects the women and children from the compassionate side of it. And it's just survival. It's just food. You're not going to see 
Bambi, you're going to see meat on the table. That's part of it. If you want to make sure people sustain, you have to take into account the mental acuity of where they're at, what they can handle. The problem that I see in most society, most social situations now when I talk to men is they're, they're leveraging a very dangerous ethos of that'll never happen as a very dangerous ethos. And here's why that's a dangerous ethos. If you hang your hat on that will never happen and it happens, you will be mentally, emotionally, and spiritually broken from the onset before you have to do anything, before survival becomes a necessity, before any of these things happen, from the onset, the fact that it happened will break your baseline. Because what you believed could never happen just happened. And now you have a whole new truth, a whole new reality that you have to contend with on top of this new sustainability model that you have to find. Get used to the idea that everything is possible. That's what worst case scenario is. It's not saying that I'm paranoid. It's not saying that this is going to happen. It is saying, should it ever happen? I'd rather have it and not need it than need it and not have it. So, you know, when you talk about apocalypse, right? And and this is this is really critical for today's society as we talk a lot about equality. And we talk a lot about men and women and roles and blah, 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 blah. You want to know the fastest way that that shit gets resolved? Put somebody in a survival situation. Put somebody in a survival situation. Because if you put a like a couple, man and woman, in a survival situation, I don't care how big, tough, or whatever a woman thinks she is, nine times out of 10, she's going to look at the dude and be like, what now? I thought you were the protector. I thought you were the man. What, what's, what do we do? It's a knee jerk. She may correct. And she definitely will correct when she realizes she married a fucking soft hand, yellow belly coward who doesn't know what to do. She'll correct and she'll be like, well, now I have to be mama bear, take care of my kids. And that's how women get stuck in this hardened femininity. Because these men who believe that it will never happen, let their hands go soft, let their bellies grow big, and let their utility go right out the window. So when things do happen, that woman's going to look over at this dude with soft hands and a big gut and completely useless. And she's going to go find the first person that can keep her safe. That could be your dad, that could be your brother, it could be a buddy, it could be a new lover. But I can guarantee you that when shit hits the fan, all of this equality bullshit, all of this fucking gender bullshit goes right out the fucking window. Because I'm going to tell you right now, arguing on an empty stomach is very fucking difficult. Arguing with chattering teeth because you have no shelter, very fucking difficult. Debating the merits of masculine and feminine role sets. When you throw up from the side of blood, very difficult to argue. Very difficult to argue. And so it simplifies a lot of things. But if you're not prepared for that simplification, things are going to fall apart real fucking quick. Because if you're, let's play this out hypothetically, you have a man who's soft and indolent and he never prepared. You have emasculated him to the point of he asks you for permission for everything. You as the woman have taken control. You're in your heart and feminine. You tell, you're the leader. You're telling them what to do. And then the apocalypse happens. And he's sitting there wide-eyed and fucking dumbfounded because he never thought it would happen. And you're now freaking out because your neighbor's 6'5", 275 pounds, and you don't trust him. I don't give a fuck how hardcore of a woman you think you are unless you got a gun that dude freaks you out because you've just taken away all moral hindrances you've just taken away all legal hindrances when the apocalypse happens law and order out the window moral implications out the window we talk about the wild wild west as if like it was so long ago it was only a couple hundred years ago in the frame of society apocalypse is just the wild west that we talk about in movies and 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 whatever that's just a de degradation of law and order that's just a, that's just what happens when people 
are left to survive and there's nothing telling them they can't do those things. That's all that is. And what do you think the apocalypse is? The apocalypse is exactly that. There's no function, no risk higher than survival. Because what law and order does is it proposes, hey, we will give you the safety provided that you follow these rules. But if you don't, we no longer provide you safety. You could get the death penalty. You can go to jail forever, whatever, right? So the consequences outweigh the benefit of making a mistake or breaking the law, right? Generally speaking. Once somebody agrees that the consequences no longer outweigh the benefits of what you're doing, law has no worth. And that's what's going to happen during the uh, an apocalyptic situation, a completely failed state. Law goes out the window, not because law isn't valid, but because when it comes down to it, the, the legal implications of I'm going to starve to death in my home if I don't break the law versus I'm going to get a fine if I break the law, nobody gives a shit. They want food. And it doesn't matter if you're nice with your neighbors. It doesn't matter any of those things. So those, those kind of thought processes are things you need to be developing now, right? I see this meme online all the time. It's like, it's about time you start wondering if your partner is good for the apocalypse. The reality is we should be thinking like that at all times. Most of the problems we have in society would be saved and solved if we thought more on the realm of safety, security, reliability, rather than looks like, are they nice? Are they pretty? Like these superficial constructs, right? But if we focus on the way that the apocalypse works, is like, are they going to go to war with me? Are they going to protect the sovereignty of this house the way I protect the sovereignty of this house? Are they going to make the, the risk of me going out and doing what I need to do to bring food back worth it? If me as a woman, are they going to go out and do those things so that I can be back home safe and taking care of the kids? Because if you don't have those conversations now, if you don't prepare those conversations now, should that ever happen in the future, you'll be fucking completely broken. Because it'll be the first time that you've ever had to audit that thought of like, shit, we're hungry. My baby's hungry. I don't feel safe. And this motherfucker is only as good as his fucking fantasy football league. The only skill set he has is number stats for a football player. He has no physical prowess. He has no endurance. He has no martial adeptitude. He has no survival skills. That's a very chilling thought process in that moment of survival. And the reason I bring this up and I talk so much on this is because when you talk about skills, right? A lot of people talk about get ammo, get guns, go learn to shoot, learn to fucking hunt, learn to grow food, all this stuff. 1000%, we'll get into that. But the reality is if you are not mentally and morally and spiritually preparing yourself for the worst case scenario, I don't give a fuck how skilled you are. I don't care how adept you are. I don't care how great you think you are when shit hits the fan it has a way of showing your true character and if you haven't prepared yourself mentally spiritually and physically for it you will be broken and no matter how much theoretical knowledge you have no matter how much academic knowledge you have you will not have the capacity to actually go and leverage those tools nor those skills if you cannot get yourself especially as a man to a place where you can agree with yourself that it is a do anything to win mentality you will lose because somebody out there once the laws and the shackles are off is like me because i am willing to do whatever it takes to make sure me and my people live thrive and survive just as my father is just as most of the men in my circle are we don't give a shit when that happens i talk about setting the perimeter it's for that situation. Blue sky, I could be cool. We could trade. We could be all hunky dory, and I can, I can joke, and that's all good. But storm season, when it's my family's life on the line, I don't care who you are. I'll go through you, and I have no qualms about it. And 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 most people in society today, they they can't think like that. They can't think like that. So what in their mind, in this romanticized idea of what the apocalypse is going to be, is they're going to be fucking James Bond, Jason Bourne out there kicking ass and taking names and 
they can't even mentally accept the fact that they're not liked online. They live by committee, and yet they think that when the apocalypse happens, they're going to be fucking out here being Genghis Khan running the world. Bro, you're scared of the social media trolls. You don't speak your mind about things that are important to you online because you fear social death. That's a soft death. Like, what do you think is going to happen when it's real death on the line? You think that's just going to dissipate? You think that fear is just going to go away? It doesn't. You have to cultivate that courage, bro. That's just the reality of things. And so I I originally wanted to talk about the skill sets that you're going to need. But I think this is in, indelibly more important is the mindset that you're going to need. Now, beyond that, and then, and then I'll, I'll stop it here. Beyond that, when you talk about skill sets, I've put a lot already in the in the portal. You can find them anywhere. But do not have a basement filled with a bunch of shit. You're, one, if you need to move, you're not going to be able to take it all. And when I say need to move, I mean you have a gang in the area that's heavily armed and very skilled. And you and your family need to fucking get out of Dodge because you don't have the capacity to take that on. You just gave all that stuff to those people. Be capable of moving on foot. Because like I said, if an EMP happens, if a grid goes down, gas will not be available, nor will electricity. So you're not moving in a vehicle. You're not moving on, you know, quickly with a motorcycle or all the shit people talk about and they show in the movies. No, you're putting a backpack on and you're hiking out everything that you want or not want, everything you need. So get really good at movement. Prepare yourself for the mental like strain of being able to pack out 80 pounds and move. Now, I I know that I can I can ruck 120 pounds. And I know that because I've done it and I continue to do it and I make sure that I can do that. And the reason it's 120 pounds is because I'm accounting for the fact that if I have children or if I have animals, I have to pack their shit. I'm not going to put it on my woman. She's busy dealing with those. I got to be vigilant. I got to be take care of stuff. So I got to be able to have a larger pack. I need to be able to carry the weight. So get physically adept at being able to carry a load, being able to move. Arden, toughen up those feet, toughen up those hands. Now, I'm I'm in this, I'm talking about preparing for literally the worst case scenario. There is a variation when it comes to end times that people don't like to talk about. They talk about it in black and white, right? It's either all rainbows and sunshine or it's the end of the world. And I'm using that as a, as a frame of reference so that I can impose upon you the gravity of the situation, right? Because you should be prepared for end times the way that I just described it, where everything's shut down, everything's broken, because every variation behind that is easier to manage, right? If you've done the prep work for the end times, if you mentally secured yourself to do have a do whatever it takes to keep your family safe mentality, all those variations become easier. So I would end it on this. What is the real possibility that this is going to happen? Because I think when you talk like this, the immediate response from people is one of two. One, they believe you, and then they become panic-stricken and they get paranoid. Or two, they don't believe you. They think you're paranoid, and they they take on the thought process of that'll never happen. There are a lot of things that has to happen in order for what I just talked about to occur. We would need at least 12 checks and balances to fail. Let's call them fail safes. We need at least 12 fail safes to break down in order for this to happen. We need the US dollar to crash. We need the grid to crash, which is already secured. We would need communication systems to crash or an EMP to go off to take out all communications. We would have to have uh, no military uh, might, so no military system in place to defend us. We would need to have... um, All farmers stop producing food at the same time or die producing food at the same time. We would have to have all trucks stop shipping food, moving food. We would have to have 
uh, an actual invasion, right, where we actually have troops coming in, and uh, a number of other softer things that would need to happen, like, um, you know, we'd have to have all all citizens be completely uh, destitute, meaning they they can't afford anything, they can't do anything, they don't they fear everything. Uh, so there's a lot of things that have to happen. So it's not really that real of a possibility in the grand scheme. And like I said, up to that that month, right? After all of that happens, worst case scenario, that month that I was talking about, that's after all those fail safes fall apart. Nobody comes back in to bring those fail safes back online. Nobody's in a place to be able to support that. You know, there was a movie, a diehard movie, they talked about the fire sale. Crash your money, crash your communications, crash your, your food and water. You do those three things, no, the system can't recover. But if you only take out one, the system will recover. That's the fail safes that we have, right? And there's a lot of it, there's a lot more nuance, more nuances within that that would happen. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't prepare for it. Because we are tracking for those fail safes to fall down. We are tracking in the direction and the and the trajectory of financial collapse. We're tracking in the direction of war. We're tracking in the in the in the trajectory of social collapse due to subjectivism and socialism, communism. We're tracking in the way of civil war. Not that it's going to happen, but we're on that path right now. And unless there's some course, some severe course correction, we're not gonna, we're not gonna avoid it. Now the degree of what happens when those happen, those could vary. They really could, right? Like I would argue that we're in a civil war right now. But right now that civil war is ideological. There's objective truth versus objective truth, right? That's a civil war that's happening right now. And if you don't believe me, look at identity politics. I think the last six mass shooters were in that community, that identity group, right? That's not me saying anything bad about that group. I'm merely saying that there is obviously a trend. That is a reality. That's objective truth. And then you have a whole other half of the United States, a whole other half of our people claiming that because it hurts my feelings, that's just not true. It might be true, but you can't say it out loud because it hurts my feelings. Like that, that is a soft civil war. And people are dying. People are dying for these ideologies. That's a reality that in, and to sugarcoat it and say, they're not like, that's just, it's, it's subversion at its finest. So as we move forward into 2024, as we, we come out of this, we have a lot of things happening at the world stage that have not happened since the creation of the U S like we have been the power play for a long time. We're not that power play anymore. That's a reality we have to come to terms with and getting prepared, getting those skills, being able to prepare. Any skill that sets you up for protecting you and your family, you should be developing. Any skill that is giving you the ability to hunt, gather, forage, or uh, domesticate your own food, you should be gather. You should be getting those skills. Any mental, moral, or spiritual decisions that you need to make to ensure that you are safe when shit hits the fan, and you are confident that you will be safe when shit hits the fan. That includes relationships. That includes stockpiles, whatever it is for you, you need to be doing that. That's just the reality. And if none of this stuff that I just talked about comes to pass, great, you're richer for it. I guarantee you there's no, there is no detriment to your life by preparing these things. You can only gain. But I can guarantee you not doing this, there's all the detriment in the world. So I know I took that in a different direction than I had planned. Um, and I got a little bit on my soapbox, but I think this is important. I think, I think we're soft. You have to realize that the U S is a war tribe. All of our money is in war. We've outsourced everything else. So we pay for things. We don't develop things in the U S anymore. So our main cash flow is war and sanctions. And now that that's falling away. You got to understand what the implications of that is as a nation and be prepared for it. There's a cool, my two bits would be just, uh, you know, it's, it's, 
as you said, the extremes and the levels, right? You can prepare for like the absolute ultimate worst. And then the person who is the, the couch potato still and like, well, where's the middle ground? Where do I start? What does it look like? You know, the, the piece about having to be mobile and, you know, I mean, literally I'm sitting here just making a list of like some of the things that are, are coming to mind. And I was like, okay, well, but how do you make that mobile? And so I, I would take it like, you know, I, I'm in California. I grew up in California. So the idea of the earthquake bag, you know, when my kids were little, we all, I kept an earthquake bag in the car. Well, what's an earthquake bag? I don't know. Like they say, the hundred year earthquake is coming. Well, I've been in California, you know, I don't know, 30 years now. And uh, there's been a few, but only one that was ever big, you know, and even then all my shit was still there, you know, some stuff fell over, but my shit was still there. So it's just a piece of like, what do I prepare? So I think having people keep a mentality of like, absolutely be prepared for the top end and have your, you know, men or some of the men around you um, being prepared for that ultimate. But what can you do in the meantime? And it, for me, that what kicked, kept coming up is that concept of the earthquake bag. Have something that's mobile. And then like, okay, so bags of food and cans of food and those, okay, well, then you mentioned jerky. And I was like, well, there it is, right? Like, what can you bring? Like, if I have to put it in an 80 pound pack and, and, and hike out an 80 pound pack, is a can of peas really the thing? Or is a, a, a flat bag of uh, um, jerky maybe the better choice, right? Um, I have a sick brain. So I'm like, okay, well, so I should probably get rope or some of this, but what's more versatile that doesn't take up? Okay, well, zip ties. Maybe I need some zip ties because I can link those together and make a rope. I can, a lot of things with it, right? So I, I would just say that, um, you know, that concept, what can I do right now for the person who isn't, you know, and maybe it's a woman, but a person who isn't like at the end of like, well, I've got axes and stone uh, sharpeners in my garage. I can just throw them in my bag because they're holding clap. <laughs> what's on my list for <laughs> the, the sharpening stone that's the thing but so okay cool i got axes but then like everybody's axes are going to go dull if we have to survive so what do you have that's a tool that's useful if i'm the only one with a sharpening stone maybe i can buy myself a little bit of time and resources because i'm the one with the sharpening stone so that kind of thought um and then even then, like having to bug out, you know, people are like, oh, I'm content in my home. And like you said, I could put a bunch of supplies in my home. And I was like, all right, well, I mean, I have a couple of locations. I have a storage place, you know, whatever. There's some locations I can put some things. Maybe I make a loaded backpack in a couple of different locations. So even if I am walking on foot, I know I can get to this place and this place, whatever. Like if I got stuff got stolen here, I got another little cache over somewhere else. And then to all of that, Everybody uses GPS for their on their phones for maps. Do you know how to navigate? Do you have a compass? Do you know how to navigate without a compass? You know what I mean? Like, okay, well, I can put a compass in my backpack, but what if I fall over and I break my compass? Do you have any other ways to navigate? Like, there are. Maybe you should know a few, you know? And so just that piece of keeping a small bag of something that has multiple uh, utilities out of it rather than just, I'm going to have a can of peas. Well, that's one can. Did you bring a can opener? You know, so like get multiple multiple uses out of whatever it is you deem is important in that bag. Yeah, and I th I think that's a very um, profound point. Is the all or nothing thinker right? Like I can eat. Like for me, I communicated all this stuff as a like when it becomes a problem, it is all or nothing, right? Sure, but it's not there yet. And to your point, you can, you can enter, you can iteratively develop, right? right? I have a kit in my closet. I have a car kit and then I have a, a tote kit that will be thrown in the car, but all the stuff in the tote kit can be thrown in a backpack or a duffel bag and I can hike it, right? It's all mobile stuff. I didn't get that stuff yesterday for $3,000. Right. I spent 20 bucks here, 20 bucks there, 50 bucks there, maybe a hundred bucks there, hundred bucks there to develop this kit over time so that my comfort level, like the whole time, right? I was developing bare necessities, bare necessities being shelter, food, ability to filter and uh, obtain water, um, keep warm and something to carry it in, right? It's very, very simple. Last week I was sitting here thinking, I don't have anything for communication. 
cell service goes down, GPS goes down. I don't have walkie talkies. I don't have CB radio. Found them online for 40 bucks. Went and bought them. High reviews. But, for me. So, so I'm a dork. So, but if there was a magnetic pulse, those would not work either. A those walkie talkie either. Or, or a CB radio wouldn't either. It depends if they're in, if they're, if they are in line of the initial blast, that initial blast is going to knock out their chipset. It will fry them. Mm -hmm. If it's outside of the yield or it's just, you know, it's the further out you get, the less damage it does sure. to powered off things, right? Because an EMP effectively just overcharges whatever's there using electromagnetics, uh, right? So if you've so ever- It's like a surge protector kind of thing. Yeah, basically. Okay. So if you, but, but so much so that a typical- commercial surge protector is not going to protect you from it. I, I get it. But that, but that if concept. Put, if you've ever put a magnet near a speaker and it, and it makes a weird noise, a buzz, if you've ever put a magnet near a screen and you see it kind of go rainbow. Um, a lot of people don't know this. I don't, I, I thought it, I think it's common knowledge just because I've been in it, but your hard drives on your laptops, they're just spinning magnets and they write data with an arm. And it literally etches it into this spinning magnet. So if you put a magnet next to a hard drive, it'll crash. It'll make it wobble and then it'll it'll just it'll just stop reading. That's what an EMP does, is it is it attacks all of your electronics through magnetic pulses. So it pulls on it and over overcharges it. And so even if something is powered off, it could still be damaged by an EMP. Even if the batteries aren't in, the chipset can be damaged by the EMP. So the general rule of thumb with an EMP is. If you're within the blast radius, none of your shit's going to work. That's a general rule of thumb. You may get lucky. Maybe there's enough space between the EMP, your wall, what it's in, what it's packaged in, the battery's out. You have enough factors to make sure that it works, but there's no guarantee. Right? So I bought those, right? So that I have them in the event that the apocalyptic situation isn't EMP. But there's right. always the potential that it's EMP and then it's a waste, right? Then I just know I won't pack those. Now I just saved myself, you know, three and a half pounds, right? So now I can put more food or I can, you know, to your point, like you were talking about, do you have, do you have the skill set if those things don't work, right? And you were talking about navigating. You're like, what if you break the compass? I was like, well, I got a watch. What if you break the watch? Well, I got the stars. Well, how do you do the stars? Well, I get a sextant. Like I'll build one out of st st twigs and a fucking um, right. rope, you know, like I know how to do those things because I've been taught how to do those things, right? I know how to set mile markers. I know how to set, you know, um, what's the word I'm looking at? Points of interest, right? So if, if you're allocating a trajectory and you're like, I need to be going here, well, then I need to keep that mountain on my right side and I'm going the right way. The minute that mountain is no longer on my right side, it could turn too far. I can use the sun, like all of these things, right? A lot of people don't realize you can use an analog clock as a compass. Right. Using the sun. And so if you know east west then you can point the clock at north and you move the hands up so that's your north point and now you can track where you're going using that and there, a lot of people don't know how to do that right so right. To your point like what are the you don't have to have all of it right out the gate and i would also add to your point you also don't ever need to have it if that is not how you're wired right like you're a lieutenant in the military and you get lost on land nav all the time, which anybody that's been in the military knows lieutenants can't land nav for the fuck of it. But if you get lost on land nav all the time, you're not the navigator. <laughs> but you better bring a skill to the table that you can trade like axe sharpening. Hey, if you navigate me, I need to go 270 degrees north towards this thing. If you can navigate me there and you have a destination, you can tell somebody, hey, I will make sure your blades stay sharp and I will make sure you have good food cooked every night. Just make sure I get to this heading. Now you have a good trade of service. Right. Right. And so if that's where you're at, that's what I mean about being honest about taking stock of like, where are you in that space? What do you have? What can you leverage? Right. We think about society today where people have specializations and we believe and if you listen to socialists and communists, they believe that that's the capitalism. That's not capitalism that did that. Capitalism is just the way of letting you choose based on your skill set what you're going to be of value. But before societies existed and it was tribal, it was about what do you bring value to? 
if you were a great butcher, then you were the butcher. If you were a great hunter, you were the hunter. If you were a great gatherer, you were the gatherer. It was it was meritocracy. And then in that, you had, he's the best hunter, and then you had the next guy down, and the next guy down, and the next guy down, and then the town fool, right? Like, guy who has no value is the guy who makes us laugh. Yeah. We, we have a lot of that in society today, especially in men's meritocracies. Like, you'll have a group of guys, and there's always that one guy that is an absolute waste of fucking space, and nobody expects him to be worth a fucking breath that he takes. But he's fun. Yeah. So we keep him around because he makes us feel good and we, you know, we need that release and we can talk shit and like blah, blah, blah. And, you know, like that's a skill. If you can, if you can make people elated, that can be a skill too. But don't expect entitlements of the top hunter when you're just the jester. Like you're not going to get the nicest cut. You're not going to get the best girls. You're not going to get the good stuff. You'll be kept alive. You'll be kept safe because you make us laugh, but you better stay funny. The minute you try and get out of station and you don't bring anything else to the table, you're going to get ostracized. You're going to get kicked out of the crew. And that's just, you know, when you talk about it from a compassion standpoint, yeah, like it sucks. It hurts people's feelings. That's fine. But if it's whether or not the guy who brings in the meat is still alive and healthy and strong enough to go bring in more meat versus the guy who just makes us laugh and sits at home all day. That's an easy decision. It fuck your feelings, bro. Like we need to eat. And so I've talked about this before. When the apocalypse happens, all this subjective bullshit about, you know, wanting to be the fucking cabin boy and having captain entitlement shit goes right out the fucking window. Like, you want to be the cabin boy? Cool. Nobody's going to judge you for it. But you're going to get cabin boy entitlements. Last pick of meat. Shitty jobs. Last choice of women. Last choice of men. You want to have captain entitlements, you better be ready to be captain. You better be the one who jumps up and says, we're going this way, and this is the way we're going, and you can either follow or get the fuck out of my way. And you better be prepared to defend it. And a lot of people aren't prepared to defend it. A lot of people want to be like, well, I think I'm smart too. Prove it. Well, I think I'm strong too. Prove it. And the minute they have to prove it, they got nothing. They got nothing. And so... There's this, there's this place, you know, to your point of like the iterative nature of being prepared. You could start right now an assessment of where you're at right now in this moment, you were doing on the call, writing down things you need, right. things you don't have. That assessment is going to be absolutely critical when shit hits the fan, because you're going to know you're not going to spend a lot of time questioning what you're good at versus what you're not good at. You're going to spend all your time doubling down on your strengths and going and finding people to fill in those weaknesses. That's just the reality, right. Of it, right? Hey, I don't know how to eat, but, you know, to be crude, I'm really good at sex. <laughs> yeah. Like that, that's something that it's crude and I don't believe in it, right? My women are never going to be. No, but that but it goes back it again to like, you know, bare, min bare minimums, you know, hunters and gatherers. Okay, well, I mean. The court gesture, maybe the court gesture doesn't, you know, is the female, she might not get the best men, but you know, she's going to be taken care of because she's providing a service. Like, yeah. you know, the, it, just, it is what it is, you know, when it gets down to having to, to be more caveman mentality, those are skill sets, you know, and, and yes, we've come a long way, but if everything collapses, it doesn't matter how far we've come. We have now come back to here. It's instantaneous back to zero. Right. So whatever those skill sets are, we better all be able to to manage. Otherwise, you know, the pretty boys with light skin and, you know, they're going to end up being somebody's, you know, or warm bitch. body. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> but, uh, was, like, right. I mean, yeah, that's the microcosm of going to zero. Right. Right. Like prison is the microcosm of going to zero. People talk about, oh, you know, prisons, vicious prisons, that prisons. This. No shit. You took them to zero. Yeah. The worst case scenario has already happened. They have no freedom. They're locked right. in a box forever. So if you want to know what apocalypse happens, look at prison. Look at prison. Prison in the United States. Yeah, prison in the United States, right? Because you've taken any you've taken any reason for them to follow your moral proclivities. Mm -hmm. So now it's just who's the bitch, who's the bull, who's the fucking it, it don't matter. What resources you have. Yeah. What can you bring to the table, bro? And if you don't bring anything to the table, you're the table. <laughs> you're the table or you're shanked and they just don't want to deal with you. Yeah. 
And, right. and, and, you know, when you talk about stuff like this, even me, I get uncomfortable talking about stuff like this. Like what I just said was very uncomfortable for me. I'm not, sure. I'm not a sexual deviant kind of person. Like I mate for my woman is my woman. And that's it. I don't, I'm not out there being promiscuous and stuff like that. So it right. makes it very uncomfortable to talk about, like, maybe the only service you have is sex, but whether I'm uncomfortable with it or not, doesn't change the fact that it's fucking reality. Right. Right. Like, like I know that I developed the skills that I have because I'm not going to be somebody's bitch. Right. I joke about it all the time on my social media. We're getting real close to Robin hood fucking Sherwood forest level. Like I, I know I've pictured in my mind what that land is going to look like, how I'm going to keep my people safe and how we're going to hunt and how we're going to keep people out of our, like I talked to my dad about it yesterday. He has a blueprint for how we're going to build the fortifications in that forest. Like it sounds funny when you put it in today's society, but in reality, that's the people you want to have. Right. Because when that shit happens, you don't have to do any of the thinking. I trust my dad's carpentry skills and his ingenuity. So when he's like, Hey, this is what we're going to do. We're going to put these things in. I'll be like, yeah, what post am I fucking shedding down? What hole am I digging? Mm -hmm. How do I get it built as fast as fucking possible? Where are we getting the resources? Right? Like, yeah. It's a fun. I mean, if nothing else, me. that's the advantage of social media, right? Is use that opportunity to learn things that back in my day was an encyclopedia that we had to read. I found right? encyclopedias the other day and I love it. <laughs> I, I'm, I might keep... Oh my God, to have one was like, we were the top end of the neighborhood. We had a microwave and a full set of encyclopedias. Like, dang. And then when but, you get to um, the point where you had that and a color TV, fucking baller. Right, right. And TV for an hour a day. Wow. Yeah. An hour on a weekend. Anyway, um, super old. Um, <laughs> um vintage. but yeah, vintage. Um, is that what the, the the kids say these days? Something I don't know. Uh, but the um, emeritus is the new word we've come up with with, with somebody, a, a fellow older person with myself, and we we're like, we're not old, senior, silver. What? We're emeritus. That's what it is. Um, oh, yeah. That's a good word. Yeah, yeah, it's a good word. Um. But anyway, it's just, uh, I, I kind of, I diverted, lost my thought. Um, where were we at? Skill sets. Yeah. We were talking skill about, because like, I was, I was talking about sex as a skill set and how I like, am very uncomfortable with it. But sure. The reality of it is that wherever you find your play, you need to, you need to find your play and you need to play it to the best of your ability because once everything falls apart, it's all meritocracy. Yeah. You're going to get ranked. You're going to get shamed if you don't. And worst case scenario, because like shame, I've been, I've been realizing that things like shame, oh, okay. judgment, and anger are insulators from natural consequence. That's why we use them. Because the natural consequence of shame is if I'm shaming you and you're doing something you shouldn't be, in a natural consequence scenario, you'd be dead. Yeah. Right. If I'm making fun of you because you're a bad hunter, you'd be dead. I'm trying to get you to realize that you need to be a better hunter. Yeah. Right. So where I was going with my thought was um, using social media to learn those skill sets. Right. right. So um, I don't know. I have family members who spend hours and hours on YouTube and that's their thing. But cool. But what are you watching on YouTube? Could it be useful? You know what I mean? Could you could you watch? I mean, I, I caught a like couple cabin. of minutes. I bought a couple of minute clip the other day, uh, not bought, but caught one um, of sharp axe sharpening. So then I was like, okay, cool. That was, that was pretty simple. The blade that that person was trying to sharpen and how they did that and whatever. And I was like, there you go. Now that's in the back of my head for sharpening axes. I need to get a sharpening stone. Did you know there's a couple of different grits of sharpening stone? I didn't know that. Now I do, you know, so useful. If I'm going to waste in a rabbit hole minute of time on something, learn a skill set. Because it'll come in handy later if you need to. Does that mean I'm going to be good at axe sharpening? No, but I'm at least going to have one step further than the person next to me who's like, oh, you need a stone? I, they're not just sharp forever? Like, you know what I mean? So, so using the social media while you have it before it gets locked down or before it gets, you know, uh, monitored and, and clipped from under us. So little bits and pieces can get you along the way, I think, was our ultimate goal of what we were talking here. Is no, there's the end extreme. But I think there's a, a good a good precursor to learning a, a skill set, right? 
like right. super randomly. I haven't, I haven't set up a kit in, in 15 years, like a, like a, a combat kit. Mm-hmm. So I'm like looking at my flak and I'm like, I'm running it. I'm running a raw flak vest. So it's bulletproof, but admin's exposed. I have no pouches for reserve ammo, I have no medical, yeah. no triage. So I'm like, I forget how to set up my kit. Yeah. Right. And, and it's just skills are deprecating, right? A lot of people don't rec- re- re- realize that you may understand the tertiary things about it, but to be masterful and proficient with skills, they, they do deprecate. Mm-hmm. And like, for me, I was looking at it, it was like, I have a general idea, right? I know I put reserve mags in the front for attack reload and I put triaz on the back for my medical kit and I got a tourniquet on one side and I know how to do all that stuff. But then I started thinking like, yeah, I could do all that stuff, but what's the best kit? Should I run an H rig or should I put it right on the bag or right on the, on the flak? Should I be, you know, running some on the side? Like, do I need side plates? Like, so then you start getting into the, the, the less low hanging fruit. Right. And so when you talk about like using social media and YouTube and stuff like that, a little bit goes a long way. Right. Like I could easily set that up by myself with no additional help or anything. And I know I'd be somewhat functional, but then I'd have to then play with it and make sure that it's comfortable and that it works functionally and all this stuff versus I could go to YouTube and I can have somebody who runs it 24, seven, 365 because they're a combat special forces guy. And he's like, listen, from my experience, you don't want your AR ammo here. That's where you want this. And you don't want your triage stuff on your left side or your shooting arm side, because that's the one you want to hold on while you're grabbing the tourniquet or whatever. So these are things that you get anecdotally that you only learn through experience. So, you know, academically, my experience was we set it up like this is the standard kit setup, but I didn't go through enough combat to make my own adjustments. These guys have. And then I do that. And then I go to the range and I test it out and I go like simulate the scenario. And now I know better. Like, yeah, I see what he's saying, putting the tourniquet here. But if I move it a little bit more towards my front hip, it's a lot more accessible and it doesn't ride on me as much. Little things like that, right? This is the kind of stuff that you can learn from social media and that you can learn from YouTube in a 45, 50 second clip to maybe a 20 minute video that could literally make the difference between feeling, uh, you know, incapable and helpless and feeling competent in what you're going to do. And I think that that's a great point to leave it on, like leverage it, leverage the portal. If you want to know how to do something, if you've like, I've always wondered what this is, fucking pose the poll, pose the question. There's plenty of people in our portal that can answer that question. You guarantee it or find you a, a, a reliable resource. Um, like I said, at the beginning of this to kind of bring it full circle, I was writing my book. And one of the things that I talk to Tish about often about writing my book is in a world where authority is no longer earned, it's entitled with social media. I can say whatever the fuck I want, whatever spews out of my mouth, I have an audience for it. It doesn't mean it's right. It doesn't mean I have authority. It doesn't mean that I've tested it. So when I was writing my book and I'm looking at it, one of the biggest things that heroes tries to do is curate information based on our like anecdotal evidence not you know tom dick harry o down here said that it's a good idea but he's only been on the range twice and that's what he thinks versus the guy who's like doing special forces for 12 years as an operator and then another eight years as a contractor like i'm gonna go with him more than the guy that's been on the range twice but we don't have that curation anymore we don't have the 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 safeguards against that so we have a lot of garbage out there we have a lot of garbage and the cream always rises to the top but because there's a sheer amount and volume of garbage it takes a lot longer for the garbage to matriculate down and the cream to get to the top and so posing a question in the portal is a much faster way than going out to social media and just trying to curate whatever garbage is out there because it's going to save you time because we're going to be able to tell you like hey like that's not we can have discussion through experience rather than discussion through theoretics right right and that was the whole point of the portal in the first place so i know we ran over by about 20 minutes tish i appreciate you staying on i know you're a busy woman um but uh and the conversation good discussions yeah absolutely all right we'll get you posted up on youtube's right uh in in whatever date timeline it happens yeah i'm behind by a week i forgot to load them last week but 
Okay. <sighs> yeah. So much editing. Good resource. People will get that. All right. No editing. We're just putting them up live. We are who we are. No, no, no. I, I, I understand that, but we have the header and the footer for the YouTubes. So oh, I yeah. just put the stuff on it and then do the YouTube thing. <laughs> the sticker and paste. <laughs> God, I wish it was that simple. I want a bulletin board. <laughs> right <laughs> it's like here press play right absolutely all right, all well, right thank cool. you. have a good week we'll talk to you we'll do okay bye